Judy Singer, we're senior vice president of Catholic Evangelical University, and I want to welcome you all to the second Talking About Teaching series. And let me just say a word about the series and how it came to be and what we're hoping to accomplish by bringing you all here. Uh, this series was actually started not by the provost office, but by a group of faculty that came to, uh, to my office and said, we have a really interesting idea. We've, we're a group of faculty, it includes Todd Rakoff here from the law school, and we'll examine this, we'll meet in a second from the business school, and some other people, and they said, we think there's too little opportunity for cross-school fertilization about teaching, and there are lots of interesting teaching practices in different parts of the university. It's not even clear within different parts of the university that faculty talk to each other, but we can guarantee that across the university, two few people are actually talking to each other about teaching. And at its core, that's something that all of us as faculty do. We have to go in and we have to teach our subjects to our students. But what we don't always have the opportunity to do is be students in other people's classes. And so the beauty of this series is that you're going to have an opportunity to see some master teachers from across the university practicing their craft. But you're also going to have the pleasure that we rarely get, which is to be a student again. And there's nothing like being a student again to give you a sense of what it's like to be on the other side. And I think one of the things that I learned from this series last year was being a student is as important as almost anything else you could learn about how to teach. Because you start to think about your own learning, you start to think about other people's learning that you're working with, and you might see things in a different way. So last year's series was focused on the case method, and we had four sessions that ran pretty much around the structure that we're going to use this year, which is for the first half, we're going to have a teacher from uh, one of the faculties essentially teach us as a group of students an actual class that he or she teaches to people. So in this particular case, we're going to have Joshua Margolis from the business school teach us a class from the field experience program that the, the business school has initiated uh, very recently. And then we're going to debrief with another faculty member leading the discussion to talk about what did we learn, how did we experience it, how would it adapt into our own teaching environments, how we might try it, and when we come back next time, did you try anything different in your class next week as a result of being in this kind of experience? So um, I want to leave as much time for Joshua to get going, but I think to just sort of set the context, it would be great for everybody to go around the room and just say your name, your school, and what subject you teach. So Judy Singer, Graduate School of Education, just education, statistics. So why don't I start with Juan? Bonnie has a in her mouth. <laughs> <laughs> My name is Lonnie Guinier, I'm a professor at the law school, and I teach, um, that's a hard one, I teach law and the political process, I teach law and social movements, critical perspectives on the law, theories of social change. Let's go quickly. Rory Dishbande, um, business school, and I teach uh, marketing. Andrea Turgulias, Design School, and I teach Project Management. Uh, Mark Mulligan, I'm also at the Design School. I'm the Program Director for the Master in Architecture Program. I teach uh, Construction Technology and also Modern Japanese Architecture. Marie Danziger, Kennedy School. Uh, I teach Political and Policy Communication Skills. Rick Pizer, Design School, and I teach Real Estate Finance and Development. Hans Peter Pfister, School of Engineering and Applied Sciences, and I teach Visualization and Introduction to Computational Science. Rob Liu from FAS, and I teach Life Sciences and Molecular and Cellular Biology. Uh, John Mina, Education School, I teach a range of things, but uh, mostly policy and politics. Suzanne Cooper from the Kennedy School, and I teach Economics. Dan Levy from the Kennedy School, and I teach Statistics. Nate Artisan from the School of Engineering, and I teach Introductory Computer Science. Rebecca richmond Cohen from the Law School, I teach Law and Film. I'm Carla Tischler from the Business School, I don't teach, but I'm here to observe. I'm Sam Moulton from the Initiative in Learning and Teaching, and I research teaching. Erin Driver Lynn, also here in my capacity for the HILT um, Initiative, Harvard Initiative for Learning and Teaching, and I used to teach in psychology. 
Eleanor Duckworth, School of Education. I teach about how people learn things and what anyone can do to help. I'm John McCumber. I'm in the finance unit at the business school. Wendy Jacobs. I'm at the law school and I teach the practice of environmental law. Todd Brickoff. I'm also at the law school. I teach uh, contracts and legal problems. So. Uh, Willis Evans, uh, I direct the Christensen Center at uh, Public Business School and also teach strategy and international political economy. Joshua Margolis, I'm at the Business School and this year I am teaching Field Immersion Experiences for Leadership and Development, which you'll get a chance to experience in a few short minutes. So I'm going to turn this over to Willis to make some introductory comments and I was remiss in not thanking our sponsors. <laughs> Let me thank uh, the help from the Harvard Education Fund Learning and Teaching and the Hauser Fund Branch that are actually making it possible for us to be here in the super hive at Harvard Business. So you're in the super hive here, not just the hive. <laughs> you have regular hives, but you're a Harvard faculty. You're in the super hive and uh, the help funds is made it possible for us to be doing this, and also uh, we're willing to talk with you about if there are uses of this physical space, because it's an interesting set of physical spaces, about whether there are opportunities for faculty from across the university to make use of these very flexible spaces that are part of the strategic. So we'll take it from here. Great. Well, it's, it's wonderful to have you here in uh, this very new space, and I just wanted to make a very brief introduction of Joshua Margolis, uh, who uh, is the uh, James Diamond Elizabeth Miller Professor of Business Administration uh, here at Harvard Business School. Uh, he's in our Organizational Behavior Unit, and his research really focuses on leadership and ethics. Uh, he's been published widely in a range of journals, everything from Administrative Science Quarterly to Business Ethics quarterly to Academy of Management Journal, uh, Organizational Dynamics, et cetera. So quite a wide uh, range of work that he's done on the research side. And on the teaching front, he's taught our leadership course, a required course for first years. He's taught leadership and corporate accountability. And we'll tell you more about the course he's doing now on field. He's also done a, a more specialized course on <coughs> leadership development. So a lot of issues around leadership and ethics. Uh, he's also, and we're incredibly fortunate now, he's the faculty chair of the Christensen Center for Teaching and Learning. So he's very involved in other dimensions of, of teaching and learning uh, at, at HBS. So I think without further ado, I'd like to welcome Joshua Margolis. Thank you, Willis. Where did Judy move to? Thanks, Judy, and to, uh, to Hilt as well for sponsoring this. And thank you to all of you for making the time this afternoon um, to join us here in the Super Hive. This building and this floor was put, this floor and the floor above us was in fact constructed in record time specifically for the purpose of creating group workspace um, for this course that you'll get a taste of today. So it's put together in record time. This is called the Super Hive because it's outfitted with all sorts of technology. Um, I've had the opportunity to teach in the Super Hive just once. I've taught in all of the other rooms that are like this but don't have the technology throughout this year. And you'll see in um, about 25 minutes um, why this sort of space is so important in contrast to our typical space where we teach cases which are tiered amphitheaters. Um, let me start by thanking Willis um, and thanking Judy for making this possible and for all the behind the scenes work that uh, went into orchestrating today and in particular I want to mention the folks who are hiding behind the partition here Liz, Matt and Simon. As you'll see our field course is absolutely impossible unless we have gurus and 911 for all of the technical um, features that enable students to learn experientially and by doing. And I'm going to um, explain what I mean by all of that by giving you a brief introduction to the field course and then launching into uh, the session, the actual teaching, and your experience of what we did last fall. So again, uh, the broad plan is threefold. Um, you're going to get a first-hand experience of a session we ran on feedback and coaching last September. That'll be sandwiched between a brief overview of this field course, this new course, really new pedagogy that we introduced um, starting uh, last September. And then on the back end, we'll have an opportunity, as Judy said, to talk about what some of the lessons are, how you might apply this to your, um, your own courses and your own teaching. So let me give you a brief overview of the field immersion experiences in leadership, for leadership development, this new course, and really it's a new uh, pedagogy here for the business school. 
And let me take you down a trip, uh, take you on a trip down memory lane. Bonus points for anyone other than uh, Willis and Rowett for being able to identify what any of these pictures are. They all come from the founding decade of Harvard Business School. Uh, the business school uh, founded in 1908. That first picture on the left is the first class of MBA students, I believe 25 regular students, 35 special students. Um, to the right, the gentleman uh, with looking very serious. He looked so serious because he was a lawyer. Um, Wallace Brett uh, Donham. He was the dean of the business school who first brought the case study method to the business school. And within about three years, um, I believe it's 90 plus percent of the sessions were taught with the case method. And on the bottom is a um, picture of uh, a part of the contest for a new building here at the school, a new classroom building back in the, I believe, early 1920s. Um, it was a losing entry, but it was the building sponsored by George Baker, where the case method was used. So that's 1908, and to fast forward 100 years, during our centennial celebration, there was um, a lot of um, introspection at the school about what should we do for the next 100 years. We have this um, well-established pedagogy. It works phenomenally well. Is there something else we should be doing that could match the power and impact of that method? And through our centennial year, um, there were a series of colloquia and discussions amongst the faculty looking at what we might do to improve our pedagogy, to improve how we function, how we teach, and how our students learn. Um, and what we did was, thanks to some research by two of our colleagues, um, Shrikant Dattar and David Garvin, the faculty engaged in case discussions revolving around some of our, um, sometimes we refer to them as competitors, some of the other business schools and uh, other substitutes like the Center for Creative Leadership, and there were case discussions of what they were doing and what the leading edge of innovation was for education of, um, in management and in business. And from that uh, emerged this book that Srikant and uh, David wrote, looking at innovation in MBA education. And then really four themes emerged from the faculty discussions and from this book, that we could do more around leadership. We needed to equip our students for a globalized world. We needed to do a better job integrating all of the subjects that they learn. And we needed to help them improve their critical thinking. And with that as the backdrop, there were a series of subcommittees put together to uh, identify different ways we might introduce innovations for each of those. And when our, um, when our new dean, Nathan Noria, uh, took over uh, close to two years ago, he launched a very ambitious uh, program of innovation. And in conjunction with the head of the MBA program, Young Mi Moon, um, they announced about a year ago, in January 2011, that we would introduce a new course designed to, um, to hit on all four of these, a new course called Field. And it would introduce a new method to be a complement to the case method, called the Field Method. Um, and in their ambitious uh, agenda, they said we would start this new course in September 2011, and it would run the full year from 2011 through 2012. And so that is the course that we've designed and been teaching since September 2011. And um, what we'll do today is get um, a firsthand experience of one of the sessions that we taught in the fall. So to give you a sense of how the field method and case method come together and why this has proven powerful even in its first year, uh, I'll lay the f uh, a framework out for how we think about developing our students to become leaders. And the mission of Harvard Business School is to educate leaders who make a difference in the world. And when we think about it, um, we borrowed a model that's been used at West Point that my colleague Scott Snook helped the school um, bring from West Point. The idea of we want to equip students with knowledge. We want to get them practice with skills so that they know how to do things more effectively. And we want them to reflect upon who they are, the being part of themselves. And this was translated um, for our purposes over the last couple of years for us to think about principles, 
practice and purpose. So the case method is especially good in imparting principles or helping students learn principles. It's less imparting them than helping students learn principles. And there the main objective is get, to get students to think differently about the problems, opportunities, and situations that they face. In turn, we hope that will influence practice, the way they act in the world. The field method is intended to give students experience acting differently, throw them into doing in rooms like this or literally out in the field. Um, and there the hope is that if we give you some experience actually doing things, you'll come to think differently about what you do. And then in tandem, if we can get students to think differently and act differently, it will help them reflect deeply, both retrospectively, who am I, look back at who am I, kind of what are my strengths and weaknesses, what impact do I have on those around me and on the situations where I take action, and think prospectively. Who do I want to become? What do I want to do in the world? How will I make a difference in the world? So the idea is for the field method and case method to work in tandem to drive a deeper form of learning. And so what we're going to do today, there are three parts to the course. Field one is the leadership immersion. Field two is the global immersion. Field three is called the integrative immersion. Um, and I'm going to say just a word about field two and field three. Field two, the global immersion, students worked in teams with a global partner, a company doing business in an emerging market. And for a week in January, 891 students went abroad to 13 different locations working in emerging markets to develop to de deliver on a consequential project for um, for a company the integrative immersion which is going on right now called field three students have to launch a business in 13 weeks a real business not a business plan a real business so right now they're at work um, building all sorts of businesses from a, um, a monthly pet supply delivery business to um, interactive blocks that will work with an iPad to enhance, uh, to enhance toddler learning. All sorts of different things they're working on and uh, in a few short weeks they will have to show that they can in fact generate revenue. That's field two and field three and I introduced those because field one had three purposes. One was to help bring together students in their 90 section subdivisions as a community and to really take seriously this idea of how do I make those around me better? How do I exercise leadership by making those around me better? The first act of leadership, making those around me better. That was the first purpose. Second purpose was to equip each student with a basic set of skills for being able to learn more effectively while they're here and to facilitate the learning of others while they're here, including, so, including their ability to operate effectively in the team projects in field two and field three. Third objective of field one was to set students up so that they could be ongoing learners when they graduate from here. And they had a basic set of skills from communication skills to teamwork skills to feedback and coaching skills that are essential for any leader when they take on any sort of an assignment to give them those skills which they then could practice not only in their projects here but in their second year of the MBA and then when they leave Harvard Business School. So I'm done now with the background on the field course and what I'd like to do now is um, throw you right into one of these sessions from field from the field one course. And I am now going, with the exception of a few moments, I am now going to act as though you are students. Back on September 14th or 15th, students did it on one of those two days, in a 90 uh, section, 90 person section. And I'm going to um, cut out a middle part of, of the workshop, but for the most part, I'm gonna throw you in just as I would run it, just as I did run it with students back, on, back in September. So uh, everyone should have a, a, a pen and a piece of paper because we're going to jump right into it. And this is just to give you a vivid sense of you are truly following in the footsteps of our first year MBAs. Please come in. There are, uh, find a table with three folks at it. So this is just, these are some shots of the students doing what you will find yourselves doing in a few minutes in these very rooms. So let's get a first hand sense. What I'd like you to do, take out a pen a piece of paper 
and let's use an, uh, an underutilized resource, which is positive feedback. Catch people doing something right. And what I'd like you to do is to identify a recent action that someone in your life took that had positive consequences, that had a significant positive impact on you or others. You directly observed it. Not something you heard about, but something that you saw. Okay? An action that you should have commended, but you did not. Okay? Something you wish you had said something positive about, but didn't. Right? I'd like you to just bring that to mind, preferably something within the last month, if not the last day. We all have these. Okay, it could be about virtually anyone, someone you're working with, someone inside Harvard, someone outside Harvard, friend, former colleague, existing colleague, whatever, just someone did something it had a positive impact. You wish you'd said something about it. Okay? Everyone have one? No. <laughs> okay. So some of you may still be trying to figure out which it is. Pick the the best one you can imagine. And what I'd like you to do is to write down what you would say to that person following four guidelines. And for those of you from the School of Education, some of these guidelines will seem awfully familiar. They're based in part on the work of Bob Keegan and uh, Lisa Leahy, but um, augmented by some uh, other things from research on feedback. But let's follow four guidelines. You would say it to the person about that person. Be direct. Second, identify specific behavior, the actual behavior that you observed that generated your positive regard for what they did. State the impact that their behavior, that that specific behavior had. Describe the impact that the behavior had on you or on others. What's the experience that their behavior had generated for you, what are the consequences that behavior had for you or for others. And remember, please, don't describe the person. Describe what he or she did and the impact it had. So I'm going to put these back up in a minute, but let me just give you a sample. Don't say, you are so good in the Civil War seminar. Your comment was exceptional again today. What's the problem with that, by the way? Just using the four guidelines. Pardon me? Too general? Pardon me? You're describing the person? Okay. Pardon me? Doesn't tell you the impact. When I hear you speak in the Civil War seminar, it clarifies the issues for me and enables me to grasp what's going on. Okay. The directly observed behavior impact it has on me, consequences that it has. Another example, you're so cheerful and happy, you're wonderful to see, especially on a long, hard day like today. Now, both of these comments in the left column are fine to say, but what we're trying to get practice with is a form of feedback that is central to being effective as you develop those around you, whether it's lateral, whether it's direct reports, whether it's those above you. You might say instead, when you greet me at the checkout every day, with a smile, it makes me feel happier and energizes me for the afternoon. Thank you. Okay. So back to our four guidelines. I'm going to ask you to just take a few minutes to write some notes for yourselves about what you would say to that person for whom you have positive regard because of something they did following these four guidelines. Okay, so I'm going to give you three minutes to do that. Okay, 
So three minutes moves awfully quickly, and you'll see the time is going to move quickly throughout our session today. Um, so what I'd like you to do now is, in your own minds, practice delivering your feedback. So just in your own mind, quietly, practice delivering feedback using this basic format. When you do the behavior observed, it had or has this impact on me or the group or others, whoever it has an impact on. So I just want to express my gratitude, appreciation, thanks. Okay, so everyone just take a minute, look at your notes, and in your own mind, imagine delivering this positive feedback to the person following this basic format. Okay, let's take this one step further. What I'd like you to do is turn to the person sitting next to you. Imagine that your partner, this person sitting next to you, is in fact the person to whom you would deliver the feedback. And what I'd like you to do is each of you take turns sharing your positive feedback with your neighbor just as you wish you had done or would do with the person who actually engaged in this action. Okay? No background explanation. Okay? You don't have to tell the other person anything. So here's where I'm going to be really strict. Okay? Do not provide any background. Just say it. Do not describe what you would say. Say it. So none of this. Willis, what I would have said is, no. I just turn to Willis and I say it, OK? And I'm going to give you a grand total, again, of four minutes. First person goes. Decide who goes first. First person goes, just as you would, body language, everything the same. Then the second person goes, OK? You ready? Okie doke. Okay, can I get your attention? So what I'd like to do at this point is to introduce the purpose of today's feedback and coaching workshop. Okay. It's to introduce the fundamentals of giving feedback and of coaching. We're going to primarily focus on giving feedback. We'll do a little bit on coaching. And obviously, in learning about this, we're going to learn something about receiving feedback effectively as well. The main goal, it is field immersion experiences. The main goal today is practice, practice, practice. Practice doing feedback, practice observing others giving feedback so that we can learn from it. And what we're trying to do is not only practice the activity, but to start to build the underlying set of skills, observational skills, analytic skills, self-management skills that are essential if we're going to be effective delivering feedback, especially when it's most important, which tends to be at those moments when it's most difficult to do as well. So we're beginning to build the set of skills that lie behind delivering feedback effectively. And what we're trying to do as well is to help prepare you so you can use your time here over the next two years to build the habits, to build the skills, to strengthen the muscles that will enable you to practice effective feedback when you leave here and are called upon to manage and lead others. A few caveats before we get into the main core of today's workshop. As I said, practice, practice, practice. The emphasis is going to be on practice. Today, you're going to have to trust us on the theory behind the practice. We have limited time, so we're not going to go into depth about why we're introducing the format, the framework we are. We're happy to discuss that at any point. But today, the focus is going to be on the practice, the doing, rather than on the theory, rather than on the principles behind it. Um, there are many, many different features that drive the effectiveness of effective feedback, right? Many features determine whether feedback ends up being constructive, heard, has an impact on behavior. Location, timing, the backgrounds of the two people, their relationship. We can't get into each of those. We acknowledge all of those. What we want to do today is equip you with the basics so that it's within your discretion to determine whether 
this is an appropriate time or place or relationship in which to deliver feedback. We want you to have the competency so that it's your decision whether to deliver feedback or not, and you don't opt out because you don't have the skill set. The idea is let's equip you, and then you'll need to exercise judgment to determine if it's appropriate to deliver feedback or not. There's lots of vari variation in how people do it. It varies by national culture, by industry, again, by hierarchical relationship, by the company you're in. A lot of things drive it. We acknowledge that. Again, we're going to talk about kind of the basic format that lies at the heart of all effective feedback. This is not about formal performance reviews. That has some added contingencies, some added facets. A lot of that you will follow up with in your leadership and organizational behavior course where you will talk about formal performance reviews. And next year there's a second year course called Managing Human Capital in which you'll also have the opportunity to go deep both into the systems and the process of delivering formal performance reviews. This is about delivering feedback of all sorts, which often does lie at the heart of a formal performance review, but isn't the sum total of it. And again, as I said, you'll have opportunities to augment what we discussed today in your course on leadership and organizational behavior. So let me give you a roadmap of what we're going to do. I'm going to introduce two building blocks, the process behind delivering feedback and coaching, the content, what should be in what you deliver in your feedback. Then we'll have a second practice round where we'll switch from positive, affirmative feedback to what people often find most difficult, delivering constructive criticism. I'll then introduce two additional building blocks, clarifying your intentions, thinking about the goals behind delivering feedback, clarifying your hesitations, being in touch with the emotional load that often accompanies delivering feedback, figuring out how and getting some practice sharing both goals and those hesitations. I'll then introduce the two final building blocks, inquiry, how do we ask questions and turn feedback from a one-way communication to an actual discussion, a learning conversation, and coaching, how do you move from delivering feedback to helping someone figure out what they can do differently to improve. At that point, after I introduce those two, we're going to break and we'll have 15 minutes to move to the hives and then we'll have an interactive exercise using the managerial cases that you read for today. So pause, let me step aside. We're not doing all of this right now, obviously. What we just did and what we'll do for the next few minutes, we did over in Aldrich Hall because most of it was PowerPoint driven and people could do it just in the seats sitting next to each other. We didn't need this space for it. What you're going to be doing, we do need this space for. So that's where we're uh, going to move in a few minutes. Building block one, you have already gotten experience with in this little exercise we just did, the process. Formulate it, practice it in your own head in front of a mirror, then deliver it, okay? That's the core of the feedback process. Okay, when we practice, rehearse it is part of practice and anticipating how the other person might react and how you might react in the conversation. That's part of practice as well. As I said, we move from kind of the core of delivering feedback to making it a conversation, which we don't always have time for when we introduce inquiry and when we start to work with the other person in coaching them. And when we think about inquiry, what we want to do is inquire, ask the other person to ascertain the extent to which they grasp the message and to help them problem solve, help them think about what some of those root causes are. And then you move from there into coaching. By the way, a summary of these slides um, are in your folders. Second building block, you've also already practiced in that very first exercise. The core content of feedback is concrete behavior that you observed, describing the impact that that behavior had and on whom or what the impact was felt you, others, what are the consequences and for whom. Very simple, deceptively simple content that all too often when we get into that interpersonal exchange, we do, we veer towards our reflexes, which is to describe the person in very vague terms and not deliver meaningful feedback the other person can act upon. So 
again, I'm going to step aside outside of the actual session. I'm going to skip ahead so that we have an opportunity to experience the pedagogy we used right here in the hives. What I'm skipping through are two rounds of practice, so we would introduce constructive criticism, a, a little exercise in the classroom where we'd ask people again to pair up, imagine delivering cri uh, constructive criticism to someone uh, in their lives, um, and then we would have them do it again, adding different pieces, adding goals, adding fears, adding inquiry, and then we would introduce coaching. And at that point, once that's introduced, we move over here and do the exercise that uh, we will do uh, in a few minutes. So uh, in, in the interest of setting you up well for that, the way the students were, um, what I'd like to do is introduce the rest of the building blocks really quickly, all of which are summarized in the instruction sheets um, for doing the exercise. So first, what we add to that basic format Okay, observed behavior, impact on whom. State the goal first and foremost in your own mind that you have for delivering the feedback. Why are you providing feedback? What's your goal? Is it to elevate the performance of the person so that he or she can realize his or her potential? Is it so that we as a performing unit can excel? Be concrete in your own mind about the goal. Write it down. Fear. Identify for yourself what fears you have in delivering the feedback, either in terms of how you feel the other person might react or how you might react. Okay. Identify the set of fears you have. So these two pieces are added to that core content. The core content is this state the observed behavior and its impact on whom. And then we add this piece, inquiry, and ask about the recipient's understanding of the feedback, ask about the recipient's perspective on the behavior. So first make sure they grasp what you've delivered, clarify if necessary, ask for their perspective on the behavior that you've identified, and work with them to identify, unearth an explanation of causes. So this is what we would introduce through a set of uh, rounds of practice. So, a pedagogical note. This is typically the place, this was typically the place when we introduced it in the fall, where students would raise some concerns. Do I really want to share my fears with someone else? Because what we told them to do is first you identify them for yourself, and then practice launching your conversation by sharing the goal and the fears and then the feedback. And that was a great discussion to have with students because it engaged them in what are the contingencies under which you would want to do it. But the main point that we wanted to convey was you're going to need to judge what's appropriate to deliver and say in any set of circumstances, but you want to have the competency to be able to do the full range and not be limited because you lack the competency. So here's the place to practice it all. And then you determine in the moment in, under the situation, given those conditions, what's appropriate to deliver. So pedagogical note aside, back to um, what we delivered. So a few notes on what we said about coaching. It is a collaborative exploration. It's not you on high giving someone the solution. Okay? You're not trying to fix the other person. You're trying to help them, work with them collaboratively to understand what the problem might be and to generate some potential solutions. And that there are kind of two faces when we think of coaching. One is psychological support, kind of the emotional booing that we can do, and the other is instrumental guidance, helping them think through, working with them to think through what they might do differently. And I'll be really brief here. There are just these contrasting views of coaching. One view of coaching is that it's all about how I get you over the hill. What we're talking about is a view of coaching that says, how do we use this particular hill as an opportunity to build your capacity? We're working together to use this particular instance to help you improve, not it's my job to make sure you get past this obstacle. Okay, just a difference in mindset in how we approach coaching. Okay. Because it conveys to that person, hey, I have faith in you that you can come up with a solution. And it builds their capacity to do their own problem solving. So if we put all of this together, the feedback process looks like this. 
You formulate it, think about your goals, identify the fears you have, how you'll react, how the other person will react. Then remember, the core of feedback is identifying the specific behavior observed and the impact it has on others. You practice that, rehearse it in your mind, maybe in front of a mirror, maybe aloud, anticipate how the other person might react, then you deliver it in, with the spe specific behavior observed and the impact. Okay, at the core, maybe adding fears, maybe adding goals, and then you add inquiry and coaching. And now we are going to have an opportunity to get to our management cases. So what I'm going to do now is introduce the process and then we'll have about 30 minutes to do this. Um, in your groups of four, and there's going to be one group of three, um, one of you will be Ramesh Patel and one of you will be Jeremy Gibson. One person will then be um, an observer and a timekeeper and another person is going to be the video recorder. And there is a small video recorder at your table and some instructions for how to use it. And Liz and her team, Liz, Matt, Simon, will be here to assist us as well. So we're really going to do this. OK? So if you are, if you are in a group of three, you won't, have, uh, you won't have an observer. So you'll need someone to uh, keep time. And here's how we're going to do it. You have an instruction sheet in your folder. But it's fairly simple. Uh, everyone's going to take five minutes to prep. Okay. Do you want to? Let's do, we, uh, we can distribute them in a okay. So uh, in the folders, you will. I'm sorry, I thought that they might have been distributed in advance. But you've got um, the folders will have copies of the slides as well as the instruction sheets and extra copies of, of the case. What I'm going to ask everyone to do is to take five minutes to refresh your memories about the case. In particular, whoever's playing Ramesh Patel and whoever's playing Jeremy Gibson should get into role. You'll have five minutes to prepare. Everybody but Gibson should really practice going through that process, practice going through the content. Imagine what you would do if you were Patel. After that five minutes, um, Patel is going to deliver the feedback to Gibson. And you're going to have five minutes to have that conversation. Now, if you're Jeremy Gibson, the goal isn't to test out the improvisational skills of Ramesh Patel. The goal is to kind of be reasonable, but help the other person right, feel what it's really like to deliver feedback and to try to coach. Okay? The third member, uh, the, the uh, person using the video camera, should, there's some instructions for how to do it, but basically you want to be right over the shoulder of Jeremy Gibson, straight on with Ramesh Patel. Okay? So you're going to record that. It's going to be a five-minute conversation, and when it is done, you're then going to plug that into the laptop, and as a team, using the headphones, you're all going to watch it, and the observer is going to help you stop and start it for places to look at so that you can all practice giving feedback, okay, using what you've learned, to the person who was Ramesh Patel. So it's kind of feedback within feedback is the way we're going to do this. Okay? So remember, as you're delivering feedback, when you watch, you want to deliver it using this formula that uh, we've discussed. And inquire, again, use inquiry, inquire to make sure that the person who is practicing feedback understands, understands why he or she acted the way they did and what he or she might do differently. Okay, so it's going to be the role play where you're going to do it, then the viewing of it where you're going to, again, practice. Everyone gets to practice delivering feedback to Ramesh Patel. Understand the basics? So we're going to distribute some folders. It will have specific instructions going through what I just outlined. And uh, we're going to give you, it's, uh, we'll give you 25 minutes as a team to do this. It's going to feel too short in your prep, but that is, uh, that is OK. OK? We're going to ask you to launch in a little too soon. I want to make um, uh, a couple of observations. Uh, the first is one of the things we discovered this year about the field method is it takes an immense amount of time. So this was a we, we distilled this down. It was a three-hour workshop, 
and we were really pressed for time and most of the time was around the doing. Um, the second is this is it. There was no debrief and part of the field, the part of, part of field is that we had to find alternative ways for students to process the learning. So we didn't come back together as a group and discuss what each small group discovered, kind of went on in the small groups, not mediated by the faculty. And then with many of our exercises, what we did was have reflections, re required reflection write-ups in which students would have to answer a set of questions that at least gave us a sense that they had to take some time individually to think through what they learned and to process that. But kind of this is where at the end of this, we gave students more time. And what happened um, with our students in the fall is that each person came, um, we gave four, they had four cases, so each person would have had a chance delivering feedback in one of the caselets. And then they watched, so each one went, and then they watched all four videos in succession and gave the person who, in each caselet, feedback on how they gave feedback. And with that, I will stop speaking and turn it over to you both. And on that note, too, we've included in your folder the other three cases. So if you're interested uh, in the flap uh, on, the, on the left, uh, you can take a look at those as well. I think what we'd like to do in these last 20 minutes is to think a little bit about how you might use some of what we've looked at today in your own context and thinking about it in several different ways. One is just the use of something experiential or the use of role play for, for whatever content is. The second is actually the use of videotaping <coughs> as, as a tool. And then thirdly, just in terms of content, just the topic of feedback and how feedback may play a role within your schools uh, and, and how you might, whether it's approaching it through the, this particular medium or others, might, might be useful. So I guess with that, um, what we've done last year is just really open it up to get some of your reflections, reactions, um, and, and, and how you feel you might be able to adapt it. So I teach having a difficult conversation in a four hour session. Uh, two students can uh, try the three. Um, one is the observer, uh, one is the uh, talker, one is the receiver. Um, uh, together with a co director. And so we don't um, have the fancy stuff. We're in an old, actually, we're not in the old building. Actually, we do this in a research building. It's a new building, but no, no fancy equipment. Um, and we literally just walk around and I feel sometimes that the students are like ballerinas and I rearrange them. Um, and so, and really I just stand there and listen and then I give immediate feedback. They do it, that all of them play a, a role of coach, talker, and receiver, so that they really, really practice um, several rounds um, and we have them pick the topics um, in, a, in a fun way at the beginning. And so if you're a big Red Sox fan, you end up having to have a discussion about uh, being a Yankee fan and things like that. So we make it really fun um, having this difficult conversation. Um, and the, we then, as uh, you say, we have to have a reflection, and then we um, created uh, a, a feedback of the course, and, and that way got feedback and uh, over three years, um, I think maybe better. So which program is this? It's this is, believe it or not, the dental school. So I teach a six months leadership uh, course in the, for the dental students, mm -hmm. and then a six months leadership course for the residents. Um, in the hope that we have the leading dentists. <laughs> <laughs> Other reactions or thoughts about applications? Of I, I guess I have a question. Uh, sure. How then do you incorporate the debriefing? I, I think if you ask students to perform, the debriefing is crucial and it is time consuming. So uh, how did you resolve that problem of finding the time for debriefing? So it was resolved for us. There was no time. <laughs> because part of introducing the new course was that um, the existing required curriculum, all of the required, I think it's 10 courses in am I right? In the first year, they only shrunk by three sessions. So most of them went from 30 class sessions down to 27. And so we had space in the curriculum, and it had to be primarily weighted to doing, actually getting students to do things. And so not just for field one, but for field two and for field three, there was very limited debrief and we kind of trusted the process that groups would do for the core learning to happen. And then part of the debrief, again, was done individually through a set of reflection write-ups that were required. But we would acknowledge that was a huge trade-off we made, but given the objectives of the course and how it was intended 
to expand what we do in the MBA program, most of the time was devoted to like, get them doing it. I would also just add, and it's interesting to see how you reflected on this exercise yourself, there's an incredible amount of debriefing of each other that's occurring, and becoming aware of how others are perceiving you uh, is a lot of what happens in this course. And so I think there's a, there's a sense that there's, among the participants, there's a, a tremendous amount of learning that's occurring as part of the way the exercises have been designed. So I mean, I, th I think something I found really interesting is that the use of the videotaping, especially in the context of something where you have two individuals that haven't pre-planned something together and are spontaneously responding to each other, you sort of, um, I mean, we had this experience of neither of us really quite expected what we would receive from the other, and that spontaneity in some ways within the framework of what we're trying to do sort of revealed things about the method but also how we approach these problems. But the, interesting, the reason why the videotaping is so important, I thought, was that normally I was so in the moment that if we hadn't taped it, I would have had a hard time stepping back and remembering, oh, that's why I did that. And so in the context of the review, I felt, I felt like I was watching someone else and could recognize things that I, hadn't, that, that I actually probably wouldn't have noticed if it was just from memory. So I really enjoyed it. I concur with that, too. I, I thought it was very interesting that we couldn't even fill out five minutes in this conversation. It, it, we got to four, almost four minutes, but then we spent 25 minutes analyzing it together and rewinding and going back. So sort of the fact that these critical conversations take place actually in very brief moments, but that, in fact, we relive them in our minds uh, quite a lot longer than that when they're really very crucial moments. It's kind of revealing, and I, I thought we had a great discussion here, really about different ways that that one conversation could have gone off in different directions. So that was really interesting. So I had a couple questions. Uh, one was, it, I don't know whether this was today because of time or whether it was the other, but you kind of short-circuited the discussion about is this the right way to get feedback? <coughs> what are the underlying assumptions? What are the other ways to do it? And, I imagine in this room, certainly, and probably even among your first year students, there are people who have previous experience, thoughts, frameworks, etc., for thinking about how to do feedback. And I found myself feeling a little uh, anxious or sort of underheard during the talking part because I thought, oh, I have thoughts on that. Like, I'm not sure really that's the right way to think about this, blah, 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 which I imagine is, you know. And uh, so I wondered whether you had thought about that and sort of what your response was to that. That was question one. And then the second question was, uh, we find our students change slowly on skills that we care about. And that there's a real trade-off between picking a few things and practicing them over and over and over and basically like doing a different thing each week and giving them some exposure. But if you really want somebody to be able to do something well, you can't count on that, at least in our experience, and we've had better luck. So I wondered sort of how you thought about where this fit in an arc and things like that trade-offs between sort of one and the other. So on the second one, uh, on the second one, uh, every team activity students have been in in the first year has involved feedback, which is part of why this was right at the beginning. Um, and so they're in discussion groups before every day before their case discussions. Those shift somewhere between every three and seven weeks. At the end of those, they have to write written feedback to each of their team members. And these two other team projects they've been on, um, they've had to do feedback at the end of those. And they had a day in which we, that we called rapid leadership exercises where they were um, in rotating teams and had four different exercises. And at the end of each of those, they had to do face-to-face -face feedback. So, Yes, this is one that we feel is so central and that students tend not to get right and revert to old habits that we've given them um, multiple opportunities. Um, and that also relates to your first question, which is, um, yes, and we even joke that we're putting you in a straitjacket. But, but our feeling was uh, did kind of two things. One, um, better that for 75% for of students, it's better than what they would do without any guidance. And it pretty much, and even if you diverge from it because you know better and have a lot of experience, which most of our MBA students don't have, 
um, this is going to, like, at least it's a starting point. And if you want to shift it or change it, that's fine. To the underheard point, um, again, that's one of the trade-offs of the field course, which is it's, it's about doing. And so we don't, and, and if we want to give students a lot of reps doing, we don't have the time we'd like, one, to explain why we do it this way, why what 95% of our students have heard coming in is the sandwich, positive, negative, positive. And so we don't even have time to say why that might not be a great idea or why it might be an idea. They do touch on some of that in the leadership and organizational behavior course. So back to, they learn the principles and the knowledge and some of that when they have a case, um, a very popular case um, in the first year organizational behavior course around performance reviews. But it's just one of the constraints we face. So just one quick comment that I want to get in. One sort of way of handling that that I found seems to be effective is just to insert a couple of sentences, which you may do in the longer version, which is, I know you've had experience with feedback. Some of you know the sandwich method. Some of you have done difficult conversations. This isn't the only way of doing it. We're just sort of picking on one to delve in and deep. And just that much really sort of resolves that sort of knot in the stomach, I'm not being heard. Mm -hmm. And any way of sort of acknowledging that people are already bringing some expertise to the conversation often makes things flow. I think it's worth emphasizing something Joshua really did mention, which was in the classrooms in Aldrich, there was time to discuss. So the pushback on like talking about fears or goals is something that typically did occur. It wasn't exactly uh, as you pointed, but so I think some of that did get expressed. Mm -hmm. Uh, in the three-hour version of this. Yes. Yeah, as experiential learning, I think this is great. Uh, where you don't have uh, all the gizmos with the uh, reporters and stuff, and you're dealing with too large a class to do that, uh, uh, how, uh, how, how does it work without the, the video? Uh, you should let us know when you go do it. <laughs> uh, so, so, uh, so, uh, our feeling was with this exercise in particular, um, so one of uh, the core objectives of field one was to build student self-awareness. One of the things we had them do over the summer was fill out the Hay Group's emotional and social competency inventory. Um, and the thing that the students uh, universally scored lowest on was self-awareness. So video, <laughs> right, as powerful as it was for us in this room, for our students, being alert to how they actually are experienced and being able to see yourself as an observer is, was incredibly powerful. So kind of video recording was at the center of our design of this when Tony Mayo and I came up with, with the workshop. We did, you know, in e each other in the rapid leadership exercises that when they gave feedback it wasn't recorded. Um, and so I imagine you get the benefit of three other perspectives without the kind of without the, the depth of seeing it yourself or being able to have a 25 minute conversation about these five minutes. But um, feedback is an important enough skill. Um, it's typically done poorly, if at all. And so sim even without video, we would have done it. So I had two questions. One is, how would you do this with faculty so that faculty become better at giving constructive feedback to their students? And especially if you had faculty who are not used to giving constructive feedback to their students, how would you expect them to then uh, uh, broker a course in which they're trying to encourage their students to give feedback to each other? Uh, sure. I'm talking about the law school. <laughs> so um, one of the tenets of the field course, we were an in, it's an interdisciplinary group of 10 faculty from all the different units of the school. We designed, um, we designed the course and we're all delivering the course. And um, so uh, right before this particular workshop, one of our colleagues in another unit, not the organizational behavior unit, came to us and said, uh, I can't do this. Like, I can't deliver this. This is too much of a stretch for me. I'm going to partner with the person in the organizational behavior unit. Um, but I'm going to start the session. Because I'm going to start the session by telling everybody in the classroom that I'm nearly 
killed the career of one of our junior colleagues. And I only realized that after I prepared for this session, because I realized that the feedback I gave that colleague about their work was exactly the wrong way to do it. And so one of the things people have said is that having to teach this has been as powerful an experience for faculty as it has been for students. So the, the not too cute answer is if you ask faculty to run such a workshop, a central side effect is there's this awakening of, you know, do I even have a theory, even if it's an alternative theory, and how am I doing it, and how do I approach it? I think also this balance between doing role play, whether it's videotaped or not, can still be very powerful to get the reactions of others. So the Christensen Center, for example, does a faculty teaching seminar for faculty in their first three years. And we have a series of little caselets we develop. One is actually set in an office hour. And as part of that, there is a role play. And faculty try to have the office hour conversation with another faculty member who plays the students. And you do that, and you ask for the reactions from the person who was the student and from the others. And even though we didn't videotape this one, you could see some of the power of that self-reflection of, well, I thought that was pretty convincing. It says, well, actually, no, it seemed very hostile. It seemed very, um, but uh, that's just, I think, another variation. I, I'm struck by how much, it, and how much less expensive it is now to come up with the equipment to actually do this, even with, with iPhones and other types of devices. So the cost of actually making this happen may be declining at such a rate that even though it may not have been possible using it in your context before, you may find it's actually, um, you know, adaptable. I know you had a, did you have a question? I'd like to ask, um, you know, experience about having difficult conversation, what we say as constructive criticism. What, what the method you describe is a direct feedback. So it's one-on-one, -on -one, you speak about it, you sit with another person, you tell them what they did right or not so good, and then you try to coach them. Sometimes these conversations may be too difficult to have, and you might get or receive feedback in, you know, metaphorical or sideways. You know, what is your experience about, you know, giving, having a difficult conversation directly and say, let's talk. You know, dear student, uh, dear colleague, uh, dear supervisor, dear, you know, husband, wife, whatever. There is an issue here. Let's try to solve it. Or versus, you know trying to show something without actually having this direct conversation, hoping that eventually, you know, we'll get the result. So what is your experience with direct direct versus not direct feedback on the critical movements? Um, so what I would, so thinking specifically kind of of the pedagogy or teaching of it, what I would say is two things. One, we, we were fairly clear, and, and Willis and I have discussed this, and what you'll see in the four caselets is um, delivering feedback can often is um, a subcategory of difficult conversation. But we intentionally wanted to make this workshop be about feedback, not about difficult conversations more broadly. And there's a lot out there, including some things at the, at the people at the law school have delivered about, have, have designed around having difficult conversations. And what I would say is um, it's not always appropriate, judicious, prudent to have a direct conversation about what someone's doing that they should improve. What we're trying to do is um, increase the likelihood that our students when they're in a position where they should give someone direct feedback, will have the capacity to do so instead of using alternative routes that tend to be less effective. But I would never say that the direct route is always appropriate. And you know, I think there's plenty of research that would try to get at it, but I think it comes down to individual judgment. So, but this is designed to equip you for, as you said, the most difficult thing, which is sitting down opposite someone, pointing out behavior that isn't working, and helping them work through what to do differently. We have maybe time for one more question. I was wondering, in preparing this unit, you must have spent a, a pretty large amount of time. And I was wondering, what were the most difficult things for you in preparing this? I mean, I'd imagine the choice of the cases is crucial. I'd imagine a lot of thought went into what you do and do not cover in terms of what you the straight jacket, so to speak. Can you maybe comment on that a bit? 
Yes, so uh, Liz probably remembers, what was it, a July night? Was it like, uh, we, um, we have an incredibly committed student and alumni body, and so we absolutely everything was pilot tested. So we sort of, we came, you know, we looked at it. I think we came pretty quickly to the idea that if this was going to be about doing and skill building, it had to be very limited and just a lot of practice. And then there was a question of, yes, there was a lot of time put in, but pretty much what we did is we looked at theories and, and approaches to feedback. We spoke to some, we, we got materials from some of the places where our students come from or end up that are good at it. So many of the consulting firms are really good at training their consultants and how to do it. So we tried to figure out what they do, what we agreed with and disagreed with. But I would say the most difficult part was um, figuring out the mechanics of running a session like this. And that, there, you know, this pilot, every, and it, it's not just the technical, uh, the, 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 the technical equipment, but it's the interaction of the technical equipment with the materials and actually being able to pilot test it with, we had about 20 alumni and second year students who came in for four hours, one late afternoon and evening. We gave them pizza and, um, and they, went, they walked through it and we probably tossed out half of what we had prepared for that because we, you know, we learned what did work. We came up with a whole set of student to student scenarios all the kinds of things that students complain about one another, like so-and-so raises his hand too much, um, talking behind one another's backs, and we ran them through not just versions of the scenarios you had, but those, they hated those. We thought those would work, like that's, that come, they, they hated them. We tried stuff with private information like you would have in a negotiation where one side sees some things and the other side doesn't. And then that became about private information as opposed to feedback. So it was testing it. We discovered, you know, you need headsets and you need microphone amplifiers if you really want to. So I think the, the hardest was um, gritting our teeth and uh, doing it iteratively and throwing out a lot of what we had prepared because you have to start somewhere and then you discover uh, what's going to really work. If, if, that, if our objective is giving them practice, what's really going to work? So. Thank you.